today, we're going to talk about bosses. How many of you love your boss? How many of you are married to the boss? <laughs> oh, oh, one honest guy here. He's smart like I am. You know, I, I was just I was reading about the boss, and, you know, sometimes I, I heard about a boss that was, uh, I heard his, uh, here come boss jokes. Is that okay, everybody? All right. Monster. My boss told me to have a good day, so I went home. <laughs> I told my boss that three companies were after me, and I need a raise. He asked me, what companies? I said, the gas company, the water company, and the electric company. My boss asked me to start the presentation with a joke. So my first slide was my paycheck. <laughs> All right. You guys ready? We're talking about relationships and the book of Ephesians. And we've been talking about the power of the Holy Spirit in our relationships. And so first we spoke about husbands and wives, talked about children, and now we're talking about the boss. Who is the boss? Spirit and power relationships. All my work is for Jesus. That's our topic today. All my work is for Jesus. If you don't mind, could you look at your neighbor and tell them, all my work is for Jesus. Go tell them that. I can't hear you. One more time. You'll be so kind. All my work is for Jesus. All right, let's do it all together. You ready, everybody? Everyone ready? All my work is for Jesus. Listen, if we'll get a hold of that and understand that, that will literally change your life. I believe, if you don't tell your boss that, I'm not working for you, I'm working for Jesus. Uh, I, don't, I don't recommend you saying that, okay? But know it in your heart. It, listen, if you and I will do our work unto God and bless those in authority over us and... For those of us that have employees, that we bless our employees, watch what God will do in your career. Watch what God will do in your company. Watch what God, God will promote you. He'll honor you. And so there is a, a rebellious culture today. It's down with the boss, down with authority, right? The problem is when you break down authority, you hurt yourself. If I have an umbrella here right now, and I go outside in a rainstorm, and I start criticizing the authority and making fun of the authority. You know what I'm doing? I'm taking a knife, and I'm cutting the umbrella, and then I get rained upon. You see, we should cover those in authority over us that it may go well with us. Very clearly, it says in Timothy. So we've been talking about relationships. All my work is for Jesus. Now, we've been talking about, let's go ahead and read the context, and we'll go back. You guys ready? All right, here we go. Bond servants... Obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord whether he is a bondservant or is free. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. Now, I just offended a bunch of people because we talked about slaves and masters. In fact, if you look at a home today, don't you dare call it a master bedroom. It's called the primary room. I always thought the primary room was the bathroom. <laughs> I didn't read, I didn't read, but, and, and, and listen, people get really hung about this, and you can see, well, what's the apostle Paul? The Bible is so antiquated, it talks about slavery. It condones slavery. In fact, during the Civil War, slave owners used to read this passage to the slaves. And so obviously the Bible's Neanderthal. It, it, it can't be trusted. We've evolved. And we can't listen to the Bible because it's about slavery. In fact, we should cancel the Bible because it condones slavery. Can I hear an amen? We're going to cancel the Bible. And this is what's happening today all the time. We take our 21st mindset and we begin to judge all of history as if we know better than the rest of history. 
The problem with that is slavery has been around since the dawn of civilization. In fact, when the Apostle Paul was writing this, he's writing to the city of Ephesus, that area. He's imprisoned. There were, at that time, there were 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. About 33%. So if we were to do it right now, there is about, in our church, there's about 400 slaves to our church population. In this room alone right now, there's probably 100 slaves if we were to do 30%. Okay, so it was part of society. It was under, in fact, slaves had slaves. It wasn't a racist thing. Now, the American slave trade, what happened in Europe, it was horrific what took place. And there's no question. And by the way, the Bible talks about slavery in the Old Testament. It's actually illegal to kidnap somebody and take them. It is a death penalty. And so that's what they would do with slave, the slave trade. They would kidnap people. So slavery is a part of it. And I just want to, I understand that, um, I understand I'm Caucasian and all that. But you have to understand that even in Africa, a lot of the other Africans were selling other Africans. So it was part of what was going on. It was horrible. It was a horrible thing. Now, something else very important you need to understand. If you don't believe there's a God, and you believe in atheism, and you believe in, in basically Darwinism, and so it's survival of the fittest, the strong survive, then slavery fits in perfectly with Nazism, right? With racism, right? We're the, we've, we're the higher, we're the evolved ones. We're better than these people. That's what that worldview would give you. However, if you believe that every person is made in the image of God and has tremendous value and that God has made every person and loves every person, then it changes everything. In fact, you have to understand something. If it was not for Christianity and the Bible, there would probably still be slavery in the world today. That's God agreeing with me. Okay. So pay attention now. All kidding aside, because what happened is you have to understand something that we're going to see today that what the abolitionists were believers. William Wilberforce came out of England, right? His, his work in Parliament took a long time, a generation. And he, what he did with the abolition movement over there got to the United States. Abraham Lincoln, and, and the people that were the abolitionists were devout believers in Jesus Christ and saw the value of everybody. Then why did the Bible allow slavery? Because it was a part of the culture. And rather than go after the legislation in the culture, the Bible goes after the heart instead. Because if you change, and listen, legislation is important. Don't get me wrong. But if you have rules and you don't change the heart. The moment the rules are taken away, they go back to that. You see, we conquered because God conquered people's hearts. The best way to change yourself is to change your heart. If your heart is changed, your behavior will change. If you believe every person is made in the image of God and has intrinsic value and that God so loved the world that he died for the person, you can't stand it. just cut you off in traffic. You will not raise your hand except to bless them with all of your hand. <laughs> so if you understand that people are made in the image of God and they have value, then how can you look down on somebody? You, should, you understand that, everybody? So Christianity was amazing. Now we're going to look at the passage right now. And so, master, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. Amazing, amazing, amazing. You see, this is what Aristotle said. You know, Aristotle, we should cancel him, by the way. Based upon this comment here, we should cancel Aristotle. Is that clear, everybody? I want you to go to your school system. I want you to call the principal and say, I want to cancel Aristotle. Why? Because of his comment here. This is what he said, Aristotle. Are you guys ready to cancel Aristotle? I want you to write a letter to your principals tomorrow. Is that clear, everybody? Because of what he just said. we got to cancel him. Look what he said. A slave is a living tool. Really? A living tool just as a tool is a non-living slave. So get rid of Aristotle. Can you see how this never ends? The truth of the matter is all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's not one that's righteous. No, not one. Everybody in this world 
is a mess. <laughs> and that's good news because Christ came to save us from the mess with a message of hope, peace, forgiveness. That's the beauty of it. You can sit around accusing everyone of doing wrong, and the problem is you're doing wrong too. But when you understand that you've been saved by Jesus Christ, and when you receive that, you can get rid of that condemnation. Here's another, here's another contemporary of that day. He said this, Whatever a master does to a slave, undeservingly, in anger, willingly, unwillingly, in forgetfulness, after careful, thoughtful, knowingly, unknowingly, is fair, just, and legal. In other words, you can do whatever you want to your slave because your slave is just property. What a horrible place to live, right? In fact, in the Roman world back in those days, a lot of the Romans, they would conquer and they would take slaves. So pretty much, they didn't do much work. A life of leisure was pretty much what was going on. So you had someone to cook, someone to clean, and they'd even hire slaves to do the work. They even hire slaves to do the work for them so they could relax, kind of like AI, right? Hopefully that we'll control AI and AI won't control us. But that's for next time Randy preaches. He'll talk about that. Pastor Randy will talk about that. But we won't go there for today, okay? So that's what begins to happen. Now, we've been talking about spirit and power relationship. All my work is for Jesus. Everything I do is for Jesus. That's what we want to do. In fact, it says in Ephesians 5.15, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, or that will ruin your life but be filled with the Spirit. So the whole context of this passage that we're in right now in relationships starts off with this. We're living in an evil day. Things are bad. What are we to do in this evil day? The best thing we can do in an evil day is become strong ourselves. And that gives us more pulling power. Before we start correcting the world, make your own bed first. All right? Instead of complaining how bad the world is, make your own bed first. Take care of yourself first. Take care of your own heart. Make sure you're right. And so this is kind of what's happening here. It says, be filled with the Spirit. Continually filled with the Holy Spirit. Speaking to one another. That's why we need one another. It's so important. That's why I want to encourage the guys to get involved with small groups and the women and the men. It's that one another that we get strong. And then later on, it gets to this in verse 21. Submitting to one another out of reverence and fear for Christ. So we're told to submit to one another in the church, that we are to submit to one another, that I am to help submit to, like for example, I'm going to give you partiality. I'm going to give you the advantage. In fact, Jesus did that. He submitted himself to the Father, became that of a slave, if you will, and served mankind. He washed his disciples' feet. He served. And he was strong, not weak. And so one of the greatest things that you and I can do is serve people. It will disarm them, and it breaks the power of the enemy. Because the enemy uses this whole desire of, give me, give me, my name is Jimmy. Right? If your name's not Jimmy, it's okay. But we want to have more. I want to be boss. But when you turn it on its head, I want to serve. That is so powerful and so wonderful in the Spirit of God. Watch what God will do in your life. Now, we've just been talking about this for a long time. Look what God says. Now, please understand this. This was written when there's 60 million slaves. 33% of society is slaves. And the audacity the apostle Paul has. Women and children were just like cattle. They're, they're not really important. You do what you want with them. Look what the apostle Paul says through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The word of God says this. There is neither Jew nor Greek. Okay? There is neither slave or free. Whoa, 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 hey, hey, hey. I mean, can you see how offensive that is? So here we are. Well, the Bible, no, the Bible was countercultural, right? There is neither slave or free. There is neither male or female. Now, we're not talking about that it doesn't make it, we're all the same. No, no, it says in value. Look at this. There's neither male or female, for you are what? All one in Christ. So the value of every person, we have our distinctives, but we have value. And so one day, God is not going to judge me if I'm Billy Graham, and God's not going to judge you, well, you weren't a pastor of a church. If God's called you to be, to be a, a janitor at a middle school, then shine the floors for the glory of God, and your reward will be the same as mine being a pastor of this church. If we all understand that all of our work we do for God, it's all important. It's all important. So all my works 
is for Jesus by showing your boss respect. R-E-S-B-T. By the way, Aretha Franklin didn't write that song. That was written by a man. So men like respect. Okay, showing your boss respect. Disrespect is such a part of our culture today, right? Almost all of humor is disrespectful. Almost all the stuff you watch or hear on, on podcasts and, and Fox News, MSNBC News, CNN, you name it. It's all about what? It's not showing respect to anyone. We are making fun of people. We're der derogatory about people, calling them idiots, and all the sides do it. It's just, aren't you guys tired? I, I don't know about you, but I'm tired of it. Are, are you guys the only I mean, am I the only one? Let's stop calling them idiots and just talk about the policies. Let's not attack the person, but attack the problem. Hello? Right? But what do we do? We attack people. Why do we attack people? Because it's a way to raise money. If you are on the right wing, the way you re raise money is to demonize your opponent. If you're on the left wing, the way you raise money is to demonize your opponent. And we're being played like a fiddle. Stop doing that. Look at the problem. Separate the person from the problem and deal with the problem. Right? We're acting like the world. You know, I'm going to offend a few of you, and if I do, I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not really sorry at all. But if you, I seen there was a church service, I'm not going to mention which one it was. So it was a national news where it was, a, it was like a conference, and people were up in the balcony having a banner saying, Go somebody. And basically derogatory our president. That is wrong. That's rebellious. It, let me just say what it is it's demonic. Now, listen, I'm from New York. I grew up on Long, Long Island, Long Island, and I have a quick, quick tongue, and we used to make fun of everybody, and I have a lot of fun at it, and it's been hard to get rid of that sarcastic, cutting humor that I grew up with. I did. I, I, was, I, was, I was the clown of the class, and I made everyone laugh. I'd say things I shouldn't be saying. Sometimes I still do it today, and so I, the Lord's had to temper me in that thing because I like to cut people and dice people and make fun of them, and it's been a work that I've realized, wait a minute, this person's made in the image of God. I cannot do that, and when you listen all day from 7 o'clock to 10 o'clock at night watching cable news all night, you're being programmed this stuff. You go to bed upset at the world. I can only take about 20 minutes a day of it, and I read. I, I stopped watching. The They're a waste of time. They just sit there with endless people talking. Well, I think, what do you think? I, th I don't care what you think. I want to hear the facts. Okay, anyhow, get me started here. Showing your boss respect. We got to show, but why? Because God has an authority structure. God gave you your boss, whether you like your boss or not. Ephesians 6, uh, 5 through 9 says, Bond servants, that means slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling. So I want you to work tomorrow. Hello, boss. How are you doing? I'm fine. No, I'm not saying that. What it means here is respect. That God has put this person over you to manage you, and so you should show them fear and respect. Honor them, because God has chosen them as, a, as, a, as your covering. Now, we're in the United States of America. We're not in slavery. So if you don't like your boss, and you don't like your company, do everyone a favor. Do everyone a favor. And after you saw it and got counsel, resign, please, and go someplace else. Because you're ruining it for everybody else. Can I hear amen? I mean, I don't know about you, but it's happened to me. I've grown up, and I'm in a restaurant. I used to work in a waiter or whatever. And as soon as the manager left, we just were well, you know, tearing them apart. I can't believe they did that. I can't believe it. And we're sitting there, and he comes back, hey, how you doing? Great, great. And then the person that's complaining walks away, and then they talk to the boss about that person. It's like a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Or cats, 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 whatever. Okay. <laughs> we don't want to insult the dogs or the cats. So bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. Oh, yeah. The unsaved boss. Treat him as he would Christ. Because he put God put them over you. So bless them and honor them. Make their job better. When they want to fillet the boss, walk out of the room. Don't hang around with those people that walk around. Talk. How about this one? There's always somebody that has a coffee cup, walks around the office place. Back in the day, you used to have a copier. Making copies. Ah, making copies. We had a guy who walks around the coffee, house, a coffee cup or the girl. Hey, what are you thinking? Oh, I don't know. What do you think about this? Oh, I don't know. Walk around. Get to your desk and do your work. I'm serious. Walking around with the coffee cup. Talk, 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 talk. Talk during the break. Just sit around with your coffee cup and talk. Get to work, seriously. 
I mean, I've done it before too. I've gotten scrolling the internet, looking at this answer. I have to stay late to make up for the time I lost. When you show up late, you got to be there at 8, you get there at uh, 8.01, and you're supposed to go to 5, you leave at, you leave at 4.58, they're stealing from the company. Right? That, God's not going to honor that. So, and, and by the way, this is for all you young people out there, if you act like this, you'll get promoted. Can I, how many business owners do we have here today? Okay. How many folks would love someone that worked hard? Can I hear an amen? <laughs> right? Absolutely. I mean, it's coming. You see, there's a couple things that happen. Let me go back to the beginning for a few moments. In the beginning, God made the heaven and the earth. Before there was sin, God created work. When God created the, all the universe, he took a break. He took off. So God made mankind to work, and it was good. good. Work is a wonderful thing, right? But even in that work, when things were perfect, you're supposed to take time off and honor God above your work. A lot of people... Like my grandfather, for example, I love my grandfather, he's German. He was an engineer. I mean, the guy was amazing. Uh, just a little bit of understanding. When the calculators came out in the 1970s, he bought one. And the problem, what he used to do is have these huge figures, like 3,366 times 285, six, or something like that, 0. 0.6. And he would do it in his mind, like this. And then he would use, the then, and then what he would do is use a calculator and use his mind to check it. And he was an engineer. I mean, he... He would look at this room and figure out the dimensions. I'm terrible at that, okay? But anyhow, so he actually believed in that, and he really cared about that, and so he loved his work. And to his fault, he loved his work so much that he, all he talked about was work. And sometimes, like, uh, on the weekends, I love, I love my grandfather, but he would say, oh, man, I wish you could be at work. How many of you do the same thing? <laughs> okay. So you can love your work. A lot of people live... They live their life to work, and that's out of balance. Or you do as little as possible so you could have leisure. That's bad too, right? There has to be a balance in it. You want to work hard, and you want to play hard, right? So this is all part of it. So bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ. You see, every person deserves my respect, whether I like them or not. Everyone deserves respect. Everyone's made in the image of God, even the people you can't stand, even the different sports teams that are out there that you can't stand, right? I don't care who they are. They're made in the image of God. Every person deserves my respect, whether I like them or not, believe in them or not, supporting them or not. My leadership deserves my respect. Now, here's another one. When I'm disrespectful to another human, boss or employee, it says more about me than it says about them. If you're disrespectful to your boss or your employee, it says a lot about you. And if you can't own it, I'm not suggesting we walk around, but if you've got a problem with someone, go to that person. Don't go in the break room and chat, 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 right? And so the Bible talks about this for a reason, because this is a problem going on in that culture. So all my work is for Jesus by showing your boss respect. Give respect. You respect your boss by arriving early, a little early, okay? Maybe 10 minutes. You show your boss respect by not talking bad about it, not creating a toxic culture. That's By the way, the word toxic workplace is overused. Stop using that. I just used it. Okay. Doing my very best. And you know, it feels good when you do your best, right? Does it not feel good when you do your best? I'll just do the least amount. Ah, here it is. Boom. Why not do your best? Do it unto God. Take pride in your work in the proper context. Do your best. It feels good to do your best, right? So do your best. Doing my very, very best. You see, how do you do your best? You do your best three different ways. You do your best with your mind. It says in verse 5, obey your earthly master with deep respect and fear. So make sure your attitude is right. And my, thank God, my wife Sandra and I, uh, thank God for my wife because I, we will confess to each other. No one knows about it, but like, honey, I just really, as much as I'm dealing with this particular person, not in this church, but someone else, some other leadership that I have to deal with, I don't like them very much and I can't stand being in, this, in their presence. But I, I realize my heart is bad. So I need to check my heart. And I'll, we'll pray for each other and help each other. And find out, what am I feeling this way for? So that you need to have your heart right, right? 
Okay, obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. Lord, I want my heart to be right. I want to look at the right person. I want to have the right attitude, right? Because what happens here will end about here. So if you get your attitude, remember, God is always about the heart first. Behavior will come because of a good heart. So you want to change your heart, it makes it a lot better. So masters, obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. Next thing we do is our will. So we do it with our minds. Now we do it with our will. What's our will? Work hard, but not just to please your master when they are watching. Here they come. And as George Costanza used to say, we, the boss comes going like this. They think you're working hard. Anyhow, so your will, work hard, but not just to please your master when they are watching. Do it behind the scenes, right? Work hard. Here's another one. Work like you're an owner, not a loner. Right? I mean, I, there's been times my wife and I, we went to this um, place. I'll be careful. What I, well, I'll just say. We went to a place. I'm not going to mention the, the place. But it, they went to the place, and they closed the, they closed the delicatessen at 9 o'clock. Okay? It's 8.45. Okay? You see where I'm going with this, right? I'll get my roast beef and my tofu. So I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm sorry, we've closed, the, we've, closed the, uh, we've closed the deli. Excuse me? And I, 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 my New York came out. Excuse me? Yeah. <laughs> Sir, it says 9 o'clock. I understand that, but we've closed. We had to clean the machines. <laughs> Should have bought a Honda. Should have bought a Honda. Should have bought a Honda, not a Subaru. <laughs> Start speaking in tongues. Okay, okay, okay. And then I turn into a Karen. <laughs> I want to speak to your manager. <laughs> sure, sure enough, that's what I did. I got my, got my roast beef. Okay, all right, here we go. <laughs> Work like, and, and, and by the way, if it's the owner, sure, I'll help you out, right? If you own the place, you take care of it. Something's on the floor, you pick it up. No matter where I go, I do my best. I was just hanging out with someone the other day. A friend Kevin came out of town. I'm walking to CVS, and there's some... I pick up the bottles and I put them in the trash can because I act like I'm an owner wherever I go. Because if I do my job and everyone does their job, everything gets better, right? Act like an owner, like you own the place. And by the way, not like an owner, like you're a jerk about it, but act like an owner, you care. If the boss sees that, he'll pay you, he'll give you a pay raise. I'm telling you right now, that is hard to find these days. Act like you're the owner. Stay late. Do more than is asked. But I have a family at home. I understand. I'm not saying sacrifice your family. But it won't hurt you to come a little early and stay a little late, okay? Work like you're an owner, not a loner. And then your emotions. Work with enthusiasm. The other day, I'm, I went to Starbucks. Can I have a pour over? What's that? You grind the beans, you take it and you pour it over. Okay. Uh, I was going, I was like, Lord Jesus, help me. I walked out. I can't deal with it, right? So be happy. Be happy. Your dog didn't just get hit by a car, right? Be happy. I have a bad day. You don't need to pour that on everyone else. That's bad. You create, I mean, seriously, I'm having a lousy day. I want to be authentic. Be authentic in the bathroom. Don't be authentic in front of people. Smile. I'm so happy to be at Cornerstone today. Welcome to Cornerstone Church. I'm Jim Carrey. No, no, no. I'm not suggesting that. But why not be happy, right? If you're depressed, do it behind closed doors and get help. But you don't need to spread it to everyone else. It breaks morale. The joy of the Lord is my strength. No matter how bad things get, I have won in Jesus Christ. The best is yet to come. I fight from victory, not for victory. I'm overwhelmingly more than a conqueror. I'm struck down, but I'm not destroyed. The best is yet to come. That's the truth of the scripture. So smile.
Your emotion, no, don't be weird about it. I'm getting a phone call here. It looks like you've taken a hard fall. <laughs> I'm dead serious. It's calling SOS. Did I fall, everybody? This is the Pentecostal preacher. That's what happens. Okay. Your emotions work with enthusiasm. In Colossians 3, 17. Here we go. You ready, everybody? Here, here we go. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you going to represent Jesus at work? How you doing? The economy is so bad. There's no jobs. <laughs> Smile! Okay, sorry. All right. I'm being positive, right? Okay, okay. And whatever you do, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks. Thank God that I have a car that can break down. Right. Thank God that I have a small house. Praise God that the toilet's overflowing because I have a toilet. Can I hear an amen? Thank God. Be thankful. You know what that does? It, it, being thankful is an antidepressant. Now, I understand that people struggle with mental health issues, and we're not making light of that, but it doesn't help to complain. If you're a diabetic, you don't have one of our donuts after service. <laughs> Does that make sense? Okay, as you can tell, I'm a little... <clears throat> and whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God our Father. Mother Teresa... Amazing woman of God. She's amazing. This is what she said about serving the poor. Okay? And that, listen, everybody, when you serve the poor, it's not always the most pleasant thing in the world. We try to help people that are poor, and sometimes they don't appreciate it. They ask for more. And you're giving all you can. Well, can I have something else? And it's so hard. Oh, Lord Jesus, help me. Right? And look what she said. We're committed to feed Christ who is hungry. We're committed to clothe Christ who is naked. We're committed to take in Christ who has no home and to do all this with a what? A frown. No, a what? A smile on our what? Not on your Instagram. An emoji's not going to do it. Okay. It takes more muscles to frown. But what about my wrinkles? I have to get Botox. That's for another time. Okay. And do all this with a smile on your face and what? Bursting with joy. Here's Mother Teresa in Calcutta in one of the worst human conditions known to man. And she would smile and give them self-respect to the people. That's what we have to do. And Jesus said this. And the king answered them. This is what Jesus said about when you help the poor. Truly, I say to you, as you did to one of these, least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. When you treat your boss with respect, you're doing it to Jesus. When you treat your employees with respect, you're doing it to Jesus. Because all your work is for who? Jesus. That's what it's for. What? You want to be strong in these wicked days? Have an attitude like that. You'll be a lighthouse in a dark place. And God will resurrect you and put you in a high place because you are showing the character of God, showing your boss respect, doing my very best. I do it all for Jesus and Right? As you would Christ. Not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ from the heart. We mentioned all that already. Rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man. Okay, everybody? And I just want to reiterate don't say, I'm doing it because I love God, not because of you. Don't even say that. Tell your spouse that or your friend that, but don't tell the person. Just do it unto the Lord that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord whether he is a bondservant or free, God will reward you in heaven and even now. When you live a life expecting nothing from anybody but are giving, you won't get disappointed. You won't get frustrated. I'm telling you the truth. Live like no one owes you anything. And you'll be free of all kinds of anxiety. I'm telling you right now. Well, they didn't show me. Who cares? God loves me. But that's abuse. I understand that. But don't demand so much. Be a blessing. Does that make sense, everybody? That will be your reward partially. You'll have peace. You'll have peace, and you'll, you'll enjoy your work. And you do it as worship unto God. You do it worship unto God. It's a beautiful thing that we can do. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Now, we do need to close this out here. 
And we got to talk about bosses fear God. Bosses, we need to fear God. These people are made in the image of God, and we're going to be held accountable how we treat our employees. We will. The Bible says, don't cause trouble for your pastor because he has to give an account how he deals with you. And so that includes parents, right? So we want bosses. We want to fear God as well. Masters, so go on, go on to work on Monday and say, you're my master to the boss. No, don't say that, okay? But masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. The apostle Paul in the book of Philemon was dealing with a runaway slave. I just read it this morning, by the way, through the, uh, through the year in the Bible. And he says, hey, listen, this guy ran away. I have authority to tell you not to accept him back, but I'm going to ask you to do it as a brother. He's helped me out a lot. Receive him back. If I need anything, payment, I'll pay for it. So he gave dignity even to the slave. So I want to conclude with this. There was a woman that, her name is Emma Daniel Gray. For six presidents, she cleaned the White House, and she cleaned specifically the Oval Office, and she would dust the chair. And she was rewarded when she retired, and Jimmy Carter was there. And what she would do, she was a devout believer in Christ. She would dust the, prayer, dust the chair and pray over it. Lord Jesus, bless John Kennedy. Lord President Kennedy. Lord, give him wisdom as he deals with this Cuban situation, the missile crisis. Lord, bless, Isaac, bless Lord God, um, Nixon. Right? She prayed over these presidents and she dusted it. And think about it. What was she? She's just cleaning the place. But what was the effect of her prayers? I wonder. I suspect one day she'll have a high place in heaven because she intercedes and bless the president that she was serving under. Do it for the glory of God. Wherever God places you, do the best you can. Let me bow your heads and close your eyes. Lord Jesus, Father, we recognize today, Lord Jesus, all of us are made in your image. And Father, we thank you for today for helping us, Lord God, through your scripture, which is truth. Father, all of us have been guilty. I stand here not above anyone else that I have been guilty of not honoring authority over me. Lord, I've been guilty, and a lot of us have been guilty of speaking ill of people of authority over us. Lord, forgive us for attacking the people instead of the problem. Father, these people are made in your image. And Father, we choose this day to bless those in authority over us. I choose to bless my overseer, Pastor Nick Fatato, who's over me. I choose to bless him and speak well of him. I choose to bless our governor. I choose to bless the president. I choose to bless the police officers and people that are over us. Lord, we want to honor and bless them and be a blessing to them. And so, Father, we pray that we bless those over us. Lord, I pray right now in Jesus' name that we would honor our bosses. We would honor our people that are over us, God. We want to ask you, bless us. Lord, let us be a blessing wherever we go. Lord, let us be like breath. Let us be a fresh breath of air when we enter our work, that our supervisors would go, oh, thank God they're here. Lord, I pray that we would take heaven with us wherever we go. Lord, I pray for promotions in Jesus' name. I pray for promotions upon everyone here as they obey your word. Lord, I pray you for promotions, pay raises in Jesus' name. New job opportunities because they're learning to be a blessing. And Father, I pray for the bosses out there. Lord, I pray that they would see these employees as someone that you're using them to look after people you love. Father, I pray that we would be a blessing, that we would help our employees to thrive and to not attack them, but attack the problems. So Lord, I pray that we would be the representations of your love and of your grace. Father, we thank you that we're here to be a blessing in Jesus' name.